I used to think that this was a really cool game mechanic. I mean, listen to that sound. But then again, it's absolutely covered with spikes. What was my thought process behind this? People will get hurt playing the game. And I'll tell you, the updated version wasn't much better. Sure, you can spin it around and add to a much better spin, but the problem is, you can still get a pretty decent paper cut here on the edge. The only damage you want to feel when playing games is emotional damage, so let's make that into a PC game instead. The year before I took my master's degree in game development at the university here in town, I was working on a board game. We were gonna make our own board games based on a theme and a mechanic we had to follow. Mine was to be based on probability and the theme horror. This game is all about trying to survive as long as possible against the other players. You make your way around the map, loop by loop, sector by sector, but there is a catch. On the far side of the player's starting position, we find the Psycho. The Psycho is this entity that moves around the map in hunt for all of the players. So whilst you're trying to survive, and whilst the other players will cause events for you to try to survive through, the Psycho is also there, trying to kill you even faster than the already existing hurdles. So this game could be fast-paced, extremely unfair, but this game had one vital flaw. It was full of bugs. Okay, you may ask yourself, how can a board game have bugs? Is it possible for a board game to even have bugs? And the fact is yes, computer games are programmed and the programming creates a bunch of rules. Rules that the game exists within and rules that you usually can't break. There are some exceptions because of the way the rules were written, but board games rules are usually being bent a little bit. I have several family members that never really plays by the rules whilst this board game played really well. The human factor made me realize probably should rework this a lot more. But before we move on, let's take a look at all of the components because I spent several weeks cutting and laminating cards, amongst a few other things. In the game's first rendition, players will start at the green area and the cycle at the red area. Then there were two different paths. You could either go the main path. The tiny path was a way to avoid the cycle because the cycle could only ever walk on the main path. The drawback of the yellow routes was that you were able to take damage more regularly because of certain events that happens on the map. Now, these events would play out with different types of cards. We had scare cards, we had special event cards, we had psycho moves cards, and we also had Danger cards. Now, I know when I'm looking at these, <laughs> the first edition, like you can barely read it, it says danger there. Not the most optimal, but I'm very happy with the design. This is an example of what one of those cards would be. So as you notice, we have certain types of ground here that makes you take damage if you're currently standing on it. And these could either affect every player on the map or individual players as they were moving around. Then we have this pile of action cards. They were pulled every round and it dictated the player's moves for that round. But as I was making this game, I realized it wasn't too probability based. It was actually more randomized because not only would you shuffle the card decks every time they were run out, but also since you were using dice, well, you had a chance of it to become a probable value of one to six. This was a random horror game, effectively. <laughs> That's why I kind of like to think about it as. And as you saw in the video intro, we had this spinning wheel as the actual like dictating control mechanism. It's a bit dangerous. I mean, it does add to the horror vibe though. The more you played, the more visceral the game would become, but we don't want that to happen, do we? And then we also had these health cards. And the thing that you did with them is that you took them like this, that's a health unit by the way, and you took it and you slotted it into it like that. I thought they were gonna be a cool thing. From a digital game standpoint, I believe this is a super cool feature to actually add visually onto screen. For players, that was not easy to do. This took more time than the actual play itself. And that's that. Let's wrap this up, because of course, I made a second version. I mean, you can imagine the amount of work that is in order to cut and, and laminate and, and fold and uh, yeah. One of the main controllers of the second game was that we would now have a new spinning wheel and as you can tell it's a lot cooler, it's not as dangerous, sure you can still get a paper cut on it and just like the other one it would have these different colors that was picked up and dictated what happened next which we will of course carry over into our digital game as well. So another welcome change was these new health slots. You'd simply just had them on the table and of course this could mean that tracking your health it added to the actual physical stress in the moment of playing the game because people go uh, uh, but it was more efficient than trying to slot them back into these slotting units. With the change of visuals of course also came changed cards we also have the action cards and as you can tell this pile is a lot more compiled than the other one. The goal of this was to create a system where the player would have a little bit more action against the potential opponents on the map. All of these assets were made in 3D and then textured with Substance Painter. The Psycho move cards allow the Psycho to move around the map and in some cases you could even teleport to different sectors. So let me bring up the map and show you what the sectors were all about. So this was the gameplay area you saw in the video intro. 
And here is where we would put the action cards. Players would pick a card and put in their action slots, and when it was their turn, they would flip it over and show the others where they're about to do this turn. There was always going to be a predetermined lockdown of what's about to happen next for every individual player. I'm not sure how I'm going to code this, but I'll probably figure out a way with my spaghetti code. So when it comes to the different sectors, if we take a look at the danger cards, one of these events could, for example, be any player who is within or moving into sector C lose one health. As you can tell on the map, there are these tiny arrows that moves around. So if you were up here in sector B, moving into sector C on your next turn, this card had been played as an event card during your turn. You took damage from moving into that sector. And this card deck would be shuffled every time a new card was drawn. And then there was the scare cards. And the scare cards were pretty straightforward. So nobody gets to use weapons this round. So if you locked in a weapon in your U slot and the near miss card was played, sad for you, that card would not be able to be played for you that turn. Shaky hands, for example. Nobody gets to use first aid pills or drugs this round because the slot on the rotator turned up to be yellow. So there was no way for you to heal. If you really needed to heal, unlucky. The Psycho Roars, for example. All players action cards this round gets cancelled and discarded. And I want to make sure we get to carry some of that over. And that's the basic premise of the game. Then with the different rule sets, when the Psycho passed you by, he would deal damage regardless of what you were doing and where you were. I think I want to implement like a hide feature into the actual game. Maybe like a 50% chance if you have just decided to do this specific action, you might be able to avoid the cycle's damage if he passes you by in this round or the next. But more about that next time when we jump into Unity to start programming this.